So, welcome back to Silmarillion Total War and to another battle replay on the finished version, at least mechanically, of the game. Um, obviously there's still the campaign and that's where all development, future development of Silmarillion is going to be going outside of very, very minor uh, changes and bug fixes potentially, but in all, for all intents and purposes this is going to be uh, the final version of certainly what we see in these multiplayer battles. And this time we're going to be seeing a 2v2 involving completely different factions actually to the last battle we saw in which Valenor were just about able to see their team over the line with their sheer quality. Once again, um, there's not really a, a theme that you can say is uh, anything that makes sense. I mean, Gondolin and I believe it's the Haladin that they're fighting alongside, indeed it is, um, could certainly fight alongside one another and it makes some sort of sense, but there's no way that Thingol and Doriath would fight alongside the horrors of Nand and Gorthab, who we'll have a look at first and foremost, because this is the player we're seeing it from the perspective of. This was another replay that was just harvested from the Silmarillion Discord as part of the clutch of replays that I was pinged um, for. So this is going to be Boris, the Soviet love hammer, who's going to be playing as Nand and Gorthab. Um, the spider riders here, the Karangui hunters, a relatively small numbers but resilient unit of uh, mounted archers. So they're going to be able to do fairly slow paced damage with their bows just because they don't really have the volume of fire but one of the main problems that regular horse archers tend to have is they're a little bit fragile when they're caught cold against foot archers or any other sort of projectiles really. That's not a problem that the Karangui hunters suffer from as much and also as a result of their higher resilience as well. This does translate in melee when they come to fight other mounted units that may want to try and run them off, though their smaller numbers can be a little bit of a problem in that regard as well. Um, but again, Resilience, the name of the game for that sort of unit, and it's what sets them apart from similar types of units from other factions. The Karangui Gore Swarm, um, these basically super-sized ticks, which they, they're they really the, the fodder of the Nandangorthab army. I mean, when it comes to melee forces, Nandangorthab maybe are the least resilient of all of the orcish forces in the game. They do make up for that in other ways, of course. We've mentioned it with their spider riders, um, and we will get onto it with regards to their infantry as well. Um, but certainly in comparison to Angban, but also Tolengauhoth, they don't have access to some of the more resilient units of infantry, which can really help hammer home that swarm mentality. Nand and Gorth definitely needs to be a little bit more careful, because while they can wash over the enemy with superior numbers as well, and the Gore Swarm are a big part of that, very, very numerous, with 200 of them, of course, um, they do have a lower resilience level, so they are going to need to rely on the ability to deal damage with certain units. And here we see the Aduso Manuthan Flesh Terrors, which are a standard unit of axe and shield infantry, very numerous as well, of course, 250. Individually, they will struggle against units of high quality. The Haladin being directly across from them means the quality gap isn't going to be enormous, but it is still going to be there if the Haladin have their higher tier um, decent line infantry, but in many ways both of them focus on the same sort of things to make up for um, a slight lacking overall quality with regards to their infantry. It's going to be supporting units that uh, really help prop up their front line, so the Flesh Terrors will be receiving that in the form of monsters in Nandan Gorthab's case, but more on that in a moment. We have the Duso Manuthan Predators, which they're a javelin unit. I mean, all forces in Silmarillion, or at least many of them, are going to have some sort of javelin option, whether that's skirmishing or whether that's hard target armor piercing javelins, um, it's a very important part of the Silmarillion meta. The Dusa Manuthan Troll Bloods are in here as well, which is a rework, I believe, of what used to be... it used to have a different name, essentially, but they're more armored compared to some of their fellows. They're obviously very small as a unit with only 30 of them, but very, very damaging with their dual axes, very dangerous, especially to a force that doesn't necessarily have the armor to be able to mitigate the damage that they can kick out. So they should be pretty good against a force like the Haladin across from them, but Gondolin are the other force on the field and they will find themselves in a slightly better position. Ah yes, this is the, um, well, the, the old version still exists, it would appear, the Duso Manuthan Flesh Feasters, so they're more of a pedestrian version of the Troll Bloods that we've already seen. Again, dual wielding axes. Um, they are more numerous, so they can be used in a slightly more orthodox manner, perhaps, than such a small unit, but still big damage being kicked out from them. Do so Manuthan Beast Hunters as well, so we've got the long-ranged option, but of course um, when it comes to skirmishing, the armor and the skill isn't really there, but the volume certainly is, and you can still support your front line reasonably well with such units. Got more Gore Swarm. 
at the back. But one thing, um, the spiders in general are what Nand and Gorka tend to be known for, and the Karangui brood mothers back here are elephant class units, really. I mean, we've seen very similar things in all of the Lord of the Rings submobs before, stuff like the Moomakill, stuff like the Beasts of Gorgoroth. I would compare them more closely to the Beasts of Gorgoroth, to be honest, because they do have these javelin men on their backs as well. And you do need to keep them moving, otherwise they will fall away pretty quickly, which could be said of Nandengorthab as a whole, but good amounts of damage as they roll through the line there, I'm sure. Moving on to Thingol's forces, and we've got an elven affair over on this side of the battlefield with Alexios 22 playing as the guarded realm of Doriath, shield bearers of Regian, a detachment, um, so half strength but also half cost unit just to help pad out the army a little bit, decent spearmen, Doriath, every bit of their damage dealing capabilities are going to be needed against a force like Gondolin but the spears will help them form a front line which can at least go toe to toe with the mighty force that they will be facing off against today. Axe Guard of Regian, good base damage against some of the lighter units that Gondolin has to offer. They will be very, very effective, but they will need to be careful because they will be outmatched against some of the really heavily armoured stuff that Gondolin has at their high end. So picking and choosing the engagements is going to be important for Doriath and trying to mould where the battle takes place and with what units is going to be pretty important, I think, for Alexios. Here, full strength versions of the shield bearers as well over on the flank. We're going to be seeing the Mounted Company of Regian, a rather basic unit in the grand scheme of things of sword cavalry, but trying to at least blunt any sort of Gondolin cavalry's approach to their flanks is going to be pretty important, you would suggest, given how deadly some of that Gondolin cavalry can be. So anti-cavalry cavalry going to be important. The Donath and Mablung, certainly the best unit of all-round infantry that Doriath have, especially against a force like Gondolin. Again, all of those armoured units which their regular axemen might not be so good against, the great mace-wielding Donath here, are going to be pretty damn good. There are only so many of them though, 69 of them. Now, moving back here, we have the Tyran Lies Danon, a throwing projectile unit, throwing axes again. Going to be very important with the amount of damage they can chuck out. If they can get their claws into the right unit, uh, they could be one of the real difference makers for Doriath here. Wardens of the Girdle are light archers. They may struggle if it turns into an out-and-out -out skirmish war, depending on what Gondolin have decided to bring. Gondolin, they can't bring everything, but if they do focus on an area, they do have really high-quality options in every aspect, really. So it could be that Doriath actually have the long-range advantage here, depending on what's across the way. More Wardens of the Girdle. And the Warriors of Regian here at the back, the two-handed axe unit, of course, the armor piercing we've already mentioned, how useful it will be for the Donath, but also here for the Warriors, if they can uh, get into the right opponent. Now, moving across the way, here we have Gondolin, played by Captain Gervais, and he does have the Marksman of the Heavenly Arch, heavily armored, very good in a long skirmish fight. Pitch battles don't tend to have the skirmish fight last forever, um, but... It will give Gondolin a real edge here. Even two units of Wardens of the Girdle are not going to be a match for a single unit of them, I think, in the long run. Guardsmen of the Harp combined with Axemen of the Pillar. So both units of standard, more medium infantry by Gondolin standards, but you have the more well-rounded swordsmen and the more damage-orientated Axemen against most, actually, of what the regular units of Doriath, provided the numbers are favourable. Gondolin will really fancy their chances even with their mid-tier units here. But they will need to maybe concern themselves I mean, going axe to axe. It's going to be an interesting fight, that, actually. I've never really considered who would come out on top in the case of just a straight-up slog between the two in that regard. But Gondolin, of course, where Doriath can't really, Gondolin can sort of sprinkle in a few units like this. The Phalanx of the King really going to help to add a really solid centre to the Gondolin force. Doriath are going to have to worry about what sort of effect that phalanx is going to have and of course we've got shielded infantry with them another unit of marksmen of the heavenly arch so it's more of an orthodox army this from gondolin heavy archer presence meaning they can dominate the skirmish force or skirmish fights and then plenty of medium and heavy infantry to slowly or more quickly potentially um, dominate up front but it does mean that if they don't dominate that frontal fight uh, they may find themselves in trouble later armorers of the hammer of uh, armor armorers of the hammer of wrath big armor piercing damage coming off of these guys so any more heavily armored units across the way are going to struggle but Doriath more of a medium faction when it comes to the elves so it's not the be all and end all for them retainers of the king bodyguard sword and board unit relatively basic this kind of unit always is in terms of, you know very straightforward is maybe the better descriptor rather than basic but we'll see how they do 
We've also got the Champions of the Fountain, big damage coming off of those two-handed swords. Obviously Gondolin's thing usually is the fact that outside of maybe some of their more basic units like the Guardsman of the Harp and Axeman of the Pillar, you can only have one or two of each individual type of unit. More archers as well, Spearmen of the Swallow, they can also be, you know, light spears in melee. So uh, cavalry has a more difficult job of shutting them down, so a flanking force there. But also the very dangerous Knights of the Golden Flower, this is exactly why Doriath would have brought those sword cavalry to try and mitigate the effectiveness of this kind of unit. And then across the way, I don't think we're going to see too much from Nif Nifaradir, the Shadow Hunter, um, because m much of the Haladin's army can hide, of course, and we're not seeing it from their perspective. The Dawarda of Ethel Brandir, really good unit in terms of how well-rounded they are, good javelin damage, also one of the better melee combatants that the House of Haleth have, but in comparison to other factions, the Haladin don't really have that really high-end punch when it comes to uh, melee might. They do have some good examples of melee infantry though. The Swear de Brothier of Brethel, probably one of the best examples of that. Relentless trait means that they can't be knocked off balance, so even if they're outmatched in a fight, they will be landing more hits than other units might, so they will always go down swinging, which is always useful. We have the War Wains of Malduin, so a chariot unit. We know what the ups and downs of a chariot can be. They can be um, an absolute match winner, but they can also be an utter waste, so we'll see. And then over here on the flank, we've got the Huskalar of Brethel and the dismounted Waldskreiter Dragoons. So throwing axes, archers, of course, ranged, both long-range and short-range projectiles are going to be very important to what the Haladin do. And trying to draw the forces of Nandan Gorthab into their trap is going to be the key. But let's see how this plays out. We'll get this right underway. I mean, surely the Karangui Hunters are going to be the thing which scouts things out. Um, actually moving backwards first and foremost, which is interesting. Um, I suppose from an Andan Gorthair perspective, like you know, moving out into these marshes, that the Haladin are going to be here, and they have almost certainly set up um, with an ambush in mind. That's often how they do things, the Friesware of Brethel revealing themselves as well. So a decent amount of Haladin forces actually over here, fairly close to Gondolin. More archers, the Warder of Brethel being a standard spear, and uh, the Fries were, of course, being a standard archer, again, wielding those spears so that cavalry um, may think twice before simply charging into them unthinkingly. Gondolin. I mean, Gondolin, you kind of know how they're going to set set up their, uh, their force. They're going to move forward. They're going to try and dominate the skirmishing fight and force Doriath into making maybe some reckless choices. The Mounted Company of Regi and moving forward, I mean, they're going to be taking frontal hits. I think they were thinking about charging in. I mean, there's not a huge amount of anti-cavalry actually in the Gondolin infantry force, so it's really only the Phalanx of the King that you'd have to worry about in terms of dealing huge damage quickly. Even stuff like the Armourers of the Hammer of Wrath, you could do a decent amount of damage off of the charge, and if, as long as you cycled back out it wouldn't be too bad, but that mounted company is going to be so important for helping to marshal Gondolin in general, that you're going to have to be a little bit conservative with them, I think, if you're Alexios in this situation. I think the problem that Alexios is going to have, though, is I don't think there's a way for Doriath to sit back and for it to go well for them, purely because of the heavy archers that Gondolin have decided to bring. Although, one thing that is immediately apparent is all of the green arrows on the minimap mean that Nandan Gorthab are heading over here to back their ally up, and Gondolin I think see that, which is why they're now shuffling backwards once again into a less exposed position. This does of course mean that the Haladin are going to maybe have to rethink what they were going to do. Sat back over here as they are, but they do have more of their units over here that can be committed. Of course the other thing the Haladin can do is maybe follow Nandan Gorthab. The Dragoons, the mounted Dragoons for the Haladin. A unit of more conventional horse archers in compared to the spider riders that Nandan Gorthab have at their disposal. Again, Marksman of the Heavenly Arch. We already mentioned how the spider riders are a little bit more resilient at dealing with counter skirmishing from foot archers than most mounted archers tend to be. They are going to have to be careful. I mean, we've got the monstrous spiders moving in the background there. I mean, 
They're going to be setting up in a very defensive position here by the looks of things. Doriath and Nandan Gorthev and the red team haven't really moved quickly enough in order to be able to disrupt Nandan Gorthev moving across the map in the way that they have been. I mean, setting up defensively like this is all well and good, but it does mean that you're backing your ability to be able to withstand ranged pressure. Are they going to be able to do that? I mean, based on the heavy archers that Gondolin have, and like, you back the Haladin archers like the dismounted dragoons and such against the ones that Nandan Gorthev have, they're maybe not in the numbers that they've been brought. Maybe this was always the basic idea. Gondolin going to shift over even further. There is the, the way around over there, but it does involve going up terrain, and it's a very varied map this. I mean, a lot of the, the pitch maps on uh, Silmarillion that were developed for it, a lot of thought did go into them, so there's a lot of variation in how they can work out. I was expecting this to be a straight-up bloody clash in the middle of the marshes, but instead they're going to be hugging the edge of the map and going to be in the more cliffy areas by the looks of things. Warriors of Regian shuffling their way forwards once more. Send the Luthan hunting pack. Getting ready to test the waters perhaps. Ardoriath. Risky. And you can see based on the minimap that the Haladin's forces have revealed themselves and are now moving. Maybe a little bit slow on the uptake there because there's no way that Nando and Gorthab were going to double back and elect to move into the Haladin's initial territory after all. Doriath moving forward, I mean, with the support, the, I mean, the idea here would be to try and overwhelm Gondolin before the Haladin arrive, at least to a certain extent, really gain that momentum in the fight, but it's going to be tough. Of course, the Wardens of the Girdle do have those poison projectiles, but it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to rout any of Gondolin's forces. I mean, just hitting a unit does cause them to become shaken, but it does, it, they're in no real danger of routing in those sorts of situations, but here we go then. Warwains of Melduin are also moving in. Axemen of the Pillar charging, getting the initial blows and see a little bit more damaging than the swordsmen that they're fighting alongside, so that's a good way of doing it. The char chariot's being used more defensively to start, but now going to be moving forward. Javelins being hit, that one. <laughs> He's going to get back up, but knocked flat on his backside, that guy, by one javelin. Forward come the Axe Guard of Regian now. I think actually we'll go down to half speed, at least temporarily, while things... Because this is, this really is going to be crunch time in the battle. It's not the longest battle going, and the manoeuvring phase lasted a little longer than I thought it was going to, actually. It's going to be the ultimate test, really, of how resilient the Doriath force can be, how Nandan Gorthev can try and get in and around the Gondolin force. We've got the hunting pack that have revealed themselves, but, I mean, decent charge. They'll do okay off the charge in, into the Guardsmen of the Hearth in particular, but... The longer they stay there, the more the, the more damage the forces of Gondolin are likely to be able to do to them. Warriors of Regian are shaken. I mean, armor-piercing damage is all well and good, but a combination of these retainers and the champions is going to be a tough thing to deal with, but getting around the flank here. The Spearman of the Swallow being forced into melee against the spiders, which is not ideal for them, but... In come the Knights of the Golden Flower, who've already taken a decent amount of damage, actually. So the Javelins from the Broodmother, and the attentions of other units as well. Poison projectiles from the Karangui Hunters. Being given maybe a bit of an overwhelming workload here, the Knights of the Golden Flower, and struggling with it, understandably. The charge was all well and good, but they haven't managed to lay any of the spiders low just yet. And perhaps the initial slow movement from all of that Haladin infantry, which is going to take a while to get over here, might well prove to be a real problem for the for the red team. I mean, it's not as if it wasn't telegraphed heavily as well, so... I mean, the war wanes in behind enemy lines, as much as the spiders are causing trouble for Gondolin's flank, these war wanes are going to cause a lot of problems for Doriath's backline. Hammer and anvil striking, and they need that flanking force of spiders and, well, large spiders and smaller spiders, really, to be able to come in and do the same thing that the chariots are doing here, because the longer this main engagement happens, I mean, with the, the two-handed spears here and also all of the damage that the regular Gondolin forces are going to be able to do to these Doriath units on the front, 
Again, it's a big ask for Dory after this. It's more of a case of survival than anything else. Of course, as time continues to pass, those Haladin units should arrive at some point. Dragoons, the Frieswear firing in. A Scarlar revealing themselves also. Dragoons, I'm a little bit surprised they're not trying to be a little bit more... I'm not trying to shuffle those throwing axes across a little bit more quickly as well, because they should be pretty darn effective against this Doriath front line, the SE. I mean, the Warwains are falling away now, but they're just really hammering home the advantage that Gondolin have on this front line. Broodmother, and they don't want to stay in melee for too long against a force like the Champions. Retainers of the King, though, taking a decent amount of damage. I mean, considering the projectiles, the javelins... And also the armor piercing blows of the Warriors of Regian. Maybe it's not too surprising. Yeah, these Warriors of Regian have definitely uh, shown what they're all about here in the early stages. Warwain's still alive as well. Dragoons. Kangui Gorsworn guarding the back lines. I mean, we're now seeing more of the Haladin start to shuffle their way across. Order of Brethel. Seeing not the last word in terms of quality, but it's just adding to Doriath's woes on the front line victory on certain parts of the line and that's surely going to mean that more of Doriath's frontline force is also going to crumble and I think the scale of Gondolin's victory from the front here I mean, Outriders of Dweil went a decent enough charge there it's a little bit strange how they, char they decided to charge in there considering it's where the phalanx of the king is but I suppose the guards of the heart were exposed well there goes the Gondolin general but the main thing here, actually, is the Tyran lies down in savage throwing projectiles, of course, and unsurprisingly, I think their target is going to be the Phalanx of the King, because there's not many ways in which they can efficiently deal with them up close, so they're going to be using all of these poison arrows and those throwing axes to full effect. Mountain Company of Regian, two units of them, the Spiders, I mean, it's a messy old fight, this. Only half the enemy force Order of Brethel charging in behind enemy lines, but... Of course, we've yet to really see Nandan Gorthab's infantry enter the fray. I mean, it's not really the last word in terms of quality, but I think Doriath and Gondolin, by the time all of this is over with, are going to be running on fumes, really, and it may very well end up being the case that it's a straight-up battle between Nandan Gorthab and these guys. I mean, Haskalar of Brethel, the sheer volume of these projectiles, we've mentioned it before, how large those archer units are. Individually these arrows are not going to carry the sting that a well-placed elven one will, but there are many more of them. Poison projectiles as well are more likely to have a catastrophic impact on the Haladin than on Gondolin. Armorers of the Hammers of Wrath. Hammer of Wrath. What of this cavalry as well? Well these fast movers, the Outriders, something of course which was hidden in the deployment phase. Doing a good job here. Those chariots did a good job early on in this engagement, but now routing off. I mean, Gondolin having no support on the front line, so things are starting to fall apart. The Tyran lies down in as well. A big part in taking advantage of the gaps, which actually they made in Doriath's line, Gondolin, but their reward for that was a savage beating at the hands of these guys, and also the spiders have certainly not been helping matters. Doriath, well, the Haladin have arrived now, but it's in a rather disorganized fashion. Ulfadin of Ethelbrandir, a Berserker class unit, dangerous in melee. Exactly the sort of thing which can be good against both Doriath, but especially Nandan Gorthab, but it's looking pretty grim here for the Haladin. I mean, they can try and form up some sort of line. There's still a few of the Gondolin forces that have returned. Yeah, their support was just too far away. If they'd been on hand, I think even if they'd started moving immediately, they would have arrived sooner, but it would no, by no means have been enough to turn this around based on the tactics and the compositions we've seen. Sword of Rothia now fighting. Again, like we said, decent melee combatant this, and they should have the edge one-to-one -one against most of Nandan Gorthab's rank and file. That might change if we see some of the monstrous units start to tear into them. As much as they're a good unit, they're not exceptional like many of the now-dead Gondolin ones. Some forces over here on the flank as well. The Gore Swarm have been revealed. Dismounted Dragoons and Warder of Brethel. 
combination of those and also some Huskala. So, I mean, the Gorse Swarm, like we said, Fodder Clash units really. So, the Haladin should be able to finish them off. But they're really just here to buy time for the main body of the blue team's army to try and pull out some sort of victory. Dowelwada of Ethelbrand are going to have to move in now and use those javelins to good effect. The Rigsware, of course, can do the same thing as well. But are they going to have the resilience to be able to deal with stuff like these big spiders in melee. What remains of Doriath, which is limited now, but their quality is going to be higher, most assuredly. Forms of the Girdle still doing their thing. On the back, mounts a company of Regian. Some of the Gondolin forces still alive, but marks another heavenly arch. I mean, the problem with going for a... you can... Be, if you go for those heavy archers, you can be sure that if it does turn into a shooting match, you're going to win. But if it turns into a faster affair like this one, heavier archers, you're really dep well, depending on how good they can be in melee as well, which the March of the Heavenly Arch can be, but it's an expensive, expensive thing. Wards of the Girdle pulling out their twin axes, and against the Fry's Wear of Brethel. You know, the difference between an elven light archer in melee and a human light archer in melee is going to be significant. Still a unit of 82 marksmen over here, mind you. With those bright blue arrow strings. Now, Wilder of Athelbrand are taking pretty much point blank hits from those Duso Maluthan predators. I mean, maybe a bit of a Hail Mary here. I mean, the Dow Wilder are very strong by Haladin standards, but again, the difference in quality between human and elves. Donath and Mablung, who also played their part in breaking the back of that Gondolin front line, are now going to be also doing the same against the Haladin. Shield bearers over there in the distance. It's going to be mostly Nandangortheb that remain at the end of this battle. In certain areas, the Haladin have been able to put their infantry under the pump as well. Brethel moving forward. I mean, they are making progress around the flank, but I think it will all be for naught in the end. Do some of these beast hunters getting into melee. The Haladin general. Loss of, loss of the Haladin general is going to be big. Do some of some flesh feasters now arriving over here, and they should be exactly the sort of thing to give all of these Haladin infantry units pause. Damaging twin axes. Those are the Orcish axes from Skyrim, if I remember. Dragoons, Donath. Tyran lies down and still doing their thing as well. In danger of actually getting some friendly fire in the Karangu brood mothers, but one player admits defeat. I think that is the Haladin. Indeed, all of those units, which would have fought for a little bit longer, but it would have been all for naught because. The stronger do so many than units were arriving and more reinforcements would have arrived over here from over here now that all of these forces have been broken. But yeah. Again, when it comes to team games, generally speaking, the team with better synergy and with a more concrete plan going in are going to be victorious. And that was certainly the case here. The blue team had a much better idea of what they were going to do and moved appropriately. I think the red team reacted a little too slowly. I mean, Gondolin, like, considering the battle took place on their part of the map, there wasn't much else they could have done about things, but yeah, the Haladin caught a little bit flat-footed on this occasion. But like I said, even if they'd started moving immediately, based on how this had gone, it would have made a difference. But how big a one? I mean, we'll never know now. Armourers of the Hammer going to be finished off by the Donath and Mablung. Fists of Mablon, as the translation goes. And, and there we have it. A victory for the Blues. Doriath and Nandangorth have a really good example, actually, of what both sides are capable of doing as well. Doriath combining that elven quality and finesse, really, with a little bit of extra damage around the edges. I mean, you know, more of a focus around axe weaponry is always going to suggest that, and Doriath certainly have that. Probably the closest... Um, approximation to a force like Lothlorien over in uh, Third Age. Nandungorthab are more of a unique faction in the sense that they are very monster heavy and kind of awkward to play as sometimes it would seem because they have a lot of lighter units. Things can go wrong for them very very quickly 
if you don't execute, if your monstrous units melt away, which is a danger, not quite to the same extent the chariots can, but the same sort of risks apply. And if they don't work for you, then your infantry isn't going to have the necessary support, and on its own, the infantry is not going to suffice against many of the factions in the game. Um, meanwhile, across the other way, of course, synergy was the main issue. I mean, the Haladin hit and run, ambushing, that's where they can really do the business, but they had to sort of charge in and try and make the best of things, um, given the you know the lost time they were trying to make up for. Um, and it, it was never really going to go that well. Gondolin, by the time they arrived, had already been pretty much defeated. Gondolin do have the quality, but when they're faced with overwhelming odds like that, the damage that both Doriath and Nandungor, they were capable of doing as well. They're capable of doing damage quickly, even to the Gondolin elites. But uh, it is what it is. Let's see what they did, that did the damage for Nandungor. And they got more, actually, kills than uh, their Doriath allies. Karangui Broodmothers did very, very well. I mean, like we said, you know, damage dealing from the monstrous units is going to be very key to any sort of success Nanda and Gorthep are going to have. The Trollbloods, we actually didn't see them in melee at all, but they're a very small unit, um, and ultimately the thing that makes them stand out in the deployment phase is the fact that they're sort of bloodied and sort of red, but as the battle goes on, that's all the units pretty much, so uh, they do have a tendency to uh, blend in, but still, good performance, 168 kills on what that on what units they were. Possibly, you know, we saw more of the Nand and Gorthev infantry later on, so it could well have been against the Haladin reinforcements that were coming forward. A few other units breaking 100 as well. Predators did very well. We saw the Javelins do nicely. Um, Beast Hunters also. Um, so yeah, a good performance, I would suggest, from the blue team. Definitely a deserved win. Um, commiserations to their opponents. And like I said, you know, Silmarillion, we're just going to be folding in a few more of the, like a few more of these in into the regular schedule, I think. Again, depending on you know, what I get in relating to tournament games and, you know, from the ongoing tournament over in uh, Reforged, you know, Siege Battles, all of that. Um, for the time being, stuff like this, like pitch battles that get posted up on the replay channel of the Silmarillion Discord are far more likely to arrive in the uh, Wednesday slot. But again, we'll see it. Playing it by ear at the moment, really. Um, but yeah, big thank you to all the players. Big thank you to the Silmarillion Discord for allowing me to take these. Hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you'll join me for whatever is next.